I want to know who picks the Scriptures for Mother's Day, right? Come on. Jeez. Uh, I usually don't um, try to overdo it on Mother's Day, but I came across a great little clip of um, stuff that mothers never say. And uh, Amanda set this up really well for me. I'm not sure it was intended or not with, with her metaphor of the shepherding parent and so and all the things moms often say. This is a list of things that you've never heard a mom say. I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look, an empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. the shower. Does somebody want to come use the bathroom while I'm in here? <laughs> All right. That's pretty great. Uh, so stuff you've never heard mom say. Um, but there's a lot of stuff we've heard moms say a lot of times, right? And some of it is the gentle correction or firm correction we needed. Um, some of it is uh, just real simple stuff. Um, you know, I love you. Um, it's time for dinner. Uh, I'll be there uh, when you get out of school. Um, uh, every uh, night as um, my kids go to bed, uh, I, I give my kids hugs and kisses and say goodnight, and then Krista has these like 5 to 15 to 25 minute conversations with them in their beds um, about everything that happened in the course of their day, right? Because that's the time that they connect. Um, and in all of that, I, I wonder um, if there's a component of being a mom that is kind of like being a prophet. Uh, so let's talk about prophets for a minute. Um, we in our culture, we've said this many times in our church, get confused about what a prophet does, right? We think a prophet tells the future. But in the Bible, that's not the job of a prophet. In the Bible, the job of a prophet is to speak on God's behalf. Because God knows the future, sometimes the prophets do tell us the future, but that is the vast minority of what biblical prophets do. The majority of what biblical prophets do is they speak on God's behalf to us. They tell us um, what God thinks we need to hear about the here and now. And even when they give us the future, it's usually so that in the present we can clean up our act. Uh, did you notice in our uh, call to worship this morning, we read a passage from 1 Corinthians where Paul's talking about spiritual gifts. And Paul says, I want all of you to prophesy. Isn't that interesting? Uh, he doesn't say, hey, prophecy is just for some people. 
Prophecy is just a special group of folks that you're never going to measure up to be a part of. Prophecy is just for folks um, who go to seminary or have degrees or um, write books of the Bible. No, he says, I want all of you believers to be prophets. I want all of you to prophesy. I want all of you to speak on God's behalf. It's a really interesting idea um, that we are all called, not just our moms, we are all called to speak on God's behalf. Uh, So we we come to this interesting passage in Revelation 11, and we have the two witnesses, right? The two witnesses who are the two olive trees or the two lampstands, and they are prophesying, uh, and they're witnessing, and they're doing amazing signs and wonders. They remind us a lot of Elijah and Moses. Uh, And then they die, and then they stay dead for a little while, and then they come back to life. What in the world do these witnesses represent? I would love to spend an hour unpacking all of the weird little details in the story, but I think some of you have lunch plans. Um, so instead, l- let me just give you the high-level summary. Uh, as I read this chapter, I-, I think the intent is that we interpret these two witnesses to be symbolic of the church, uh, that the church's work is to be a prophetic witness just as these two um, people are prophetically witnessing to the world. A couple quick reasons for that. Um, we're told that they are like olive trees and lampstands. Earlier in the book of Revelation, there are seven lampstands which are explicitly equated with churches, right? Lampstands equal churches in the book of Revelation. Um, we read in Zechariah the story of the two anointed ones, the olive trees and the lampstands that represent the king and the priest. Uh, and the work of the church is to be, as Peter tells us, a royal priesthood, right? We're supposed to be a kingdom of priests. We're supposed to be uh, the daughters and sons of the King of Heaven. Uh, And so this idea uh, that the prophets um, in this passage are representing the work of the church is a really important one for us because if that's correct, then we get a little bit of an idea of what it looks like for us to be prophetic witnesses what it means for us to be people who speak for God. And I want to suggest um, in this example in Revelation, there are three components of that work that the church is supposed to be about. Now, the first is really simply we, we speak for God. The second is um, we act for God. And the third is we carry a cross for God. Right? So it's our words, our actions, and our cross that are the ways we live out the calling to be the end time church. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about speaking for God. Um, So I I mentioned earlier, I think sometimes um, moms can do this, right? Sometimes um, when a mom tells us she loves us and when she shows us unconditional love, we get a little glimpse of that love of God. Um, When my mom says, uh, don't start eating before we give thanks to God for our food, or I'm sorry you're tired, but in our family we get up and go to church on Sunday, or, I love you and Jesus loves you. Um, she's speaking for God in my life. And, and our job is to be a people who speak for God in the lives of other people. This is sometimes pretty intimidating and, and pretty scary, right? So um, let me give you a, a couple of ideas that will help you with this. Uh, the first is, when you're speaking for God, um, make sure um, you're speaking something that God thinks, right? It shouldn't just be what you think, and you put God's label on it. That's going to get you in trouble, right? There's a lot of stuff in the Bible about false prophets. That's what that means. Um, so we've got to be in the Word of the Lord to know God's will and, and how to share it. Um, and, and then really simply, normally when we're speaking for God, when we're being a witness for God, we're just telling what God has done in our lives, right? What ways we've seen God's love poured out, and especially how we've encountered the story of Jesus, right? And who Jesus is and what He's done for us. And everybody who, who speaks for God is going to do it in a little bit of a different way, in a different style, and that's okay. Um, and sometimes this is kind of intimidating. It's kind of, it's kind of scary to be responsible for speaking up for God in somebody else's life. Uh, D.L. Moody tells a story. Uh, D.L. Moody's a famous evangelist and, and teacher, and um, he says uh, one day he was talking with a woman, uh, and he had just shared the gospel with somebody, and she was around. And 
she came up to him afterwards. She said, you know, Pastor Moody, I'm going to be honest. I don't really love your style of evangelism. And he said, you know what? I'm going to be honest. I don't really love my style of evangelism either. Either. Um, how do you talk about your faith? And she was like, well, I don't really. He said, well, I like my style of evangelism better than I like yours. Um, Howard Hendricks says uh, that the world is a generation screaming for answers and Christians are stuttering. So um, w- w- one of the things that I often hear is people say, boy, when an opportunity comes along to talk about my faith, I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to say. And, and my response is always, I'm mean, going to try to be gracious about it, but my response is always, go practice. Right? What in your life can you do without practicing? Tell me um, the time you got in front of a group of people and talked to them without practicing what you were going to say and how it went. Tell me the time that you tried to play a sport without practicing the sport and how it went. Tell me the time uh, you tried to sing in public and you never practiced the song before and how it went. Of course, if the first time you think about sharing your faith or telling what God has done in your life is when somebody asks you to do it in public or in front of a non-believer, you're not going to be ready, right? Practice your story. Go home and practice. This is, this is um, my permission giving for you. Go home today and talk to a friend or a loved one or a family member and say, the pastor told me I had to call you and talk about what God's done in my life because I need to practice, right? Um, so that when somebody asks you for the most important thing you could possibly share, you're ready to share it. So, Practice your story. Practice the way um, that you remember and tell what God's done in your life so that uh, in those moments you're ready to speak up and share. And then, um, this is so important, uh, in, in Revelation it's not just that the, the two witnesses that represent the church go around telling the story of God. They also confirm it with signs. They do amazing, miraculous things. Right? Like, I mean, I don't really recommend that you consume people with fire out of your mouth. If that's your spiritual gift, maybe rein that in a little bit. But um, the idea of confirming the message of God with signs is pretty powerful, right? Uh, There's there's a book called Death and the Caring Community by Larry Richards and Paul Johnson. And in it, they tell a story uh, of a guy named Jack. Uh, Jack was a president of a large corporation, and when he got cancer, uh, the corporation dumped him. Uh, He went through his insurance, he used his life savings, and in the end, he had almost nothing left. Uh, And... um, Larry, one of the authors of the book, shares that there was a time where he visited Jack with one of his deacons, and the deacon said, Jack, you speak so openly about the brief life you have left. I wonder if you've prepared for your life after death. And Jack stood up, livid with rage. He said, you bleepity bleep Christians, all you ever think about is what's going to happen to me after I die. If your God is so great, why doesn't he do something about the real problems of life? He went on to talk about how he was leaving his wife penniless, how there was no money for his daughter to go to college, and then he kicked him out of his house. Larry says uh, sometime later, um, his deacon insisted they go back, and they did. Uh, And he said, Jack, I know I offended you. I humbly apologize. But I want you to know I've been working since then. Your first problem is where your family will live after you die. A realtor in our church has agreed to sell your house and give your wife his commission. I guarantee you that, if you'll permit us, some other men and I will make the house payments until it's sold. Then I've contracted the owner of an apartment house down the street. He's offered your wife a three-bedroom apartment plus free utilities and an $850 a month salary in return for her collecting rents and supervising plumbing and electrical repairs. The income from your house should pay for your daughter's college. I just want you to know your family will be cared for. Larry says, Jack cried like a baby. He died shortly thereafter, so wrapped in pain, he was never able to accept Jesus. But he experienced God's love, and even his widow, touched by the Christians in her life, responded to the gospel message. See, it's not enough just to speak for Jesus, right? You have to then act like Jesus. You have to confirm the Word of God with the love of God. Um, There are people today in our church that are here because somebody invited them, and then after inviting them, they drove to their house and picked them up and brought them to worship, 
right? Uh, it's not enough just to say, hey, I hope you'll come to celebrate recovery sometime and find healing for your addiction. You got to go and pick that person up and bring them, right? You got to confirm um, the, the, the story and the love of Jesus with the actions and the love of Jesus. Uh, another way, in other words, don't waste time speaking about Jesus if you won't love like Jesus. By the way, um, we are still a people that believe in miraculous signs, but we still believe that God answers prayers and does extraordinary things. And absolutely, we should ask God to do that in the lives of people that we love. But remember that Jesus' power was not just in His miracles, but also in His willingness to love those no one else loved, to touch those no one else touched, and to walk and talk with those who no one else would walk or talk with. So, uh, in Revelation, the church speaks on God's behalf, and they confirm God's word with signs, uh, and then they die, and they stay dead for a long time, and then they come back. Part of the work of the church is not just to speak on God's behalf and show God's love with our actions, um, but to, as Jesus says, pick up our cross daily and follow Him. That if you're called to be a prophetic witness in the life of someone that you love, there's going to be a component of the cross in it. I don't know what that's going to be. I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, it's not something we seek out or hope for. It's simply the reality that if we're followers of Jesus, we should expect a life like His if we want to have an eternal life like His. And sometimes our job is simply to hold on to the gospel even when it gets really, really hard. Uh, I came across a story this week um, from uh, January 19th, 1930. Actually, January 20th, 1930 is, is when this newspaper article was written in the New York Times. Uh, it's a story about a speech that was given by King George V to the Naval Academy in London. Uh, and uh, a few minutes before the king was supposed to speak, um, a member of the control room staff of the Columbia Broadcasting Company tripped over a wire leading to the generator which energized the network. This was a speech that was supposed to go out by radio to the United States and to Canada and all around the world, uh, and this guy unplugs the machine. There's a guy named Harold Vivian who was the chief control operator of the Columbia Broadcasting Company. And Vivian examined the breakage. It would take 20 minutes, he realized, to make repairs. Meanwhile, the King's speech would be over and thousands of radio listeners who had set up late or risen early to hear him would be disappointed. So Vivian grasped the ends of each side of the broken wire, one in each hand, and restored the circuit through his own body. The shocks of the 250-volt charge and the leakage of the current through his body to the floor shook his arms with spasms, but he held on until the new wires could be connected. By that time, his hands had been slightly burned, and he was feeling the effects of the ordeal. As soon as the broadcast was finished, he was sent home to bed. Officials of the company said he was not seriously hurt the following day. The king's speech lasted six minutes. His voice was heard clearly by the audience in London, but none of the thousands of the Columbia's listeners were aware that save for Vivian's presence of mind and his pluck and clinging to the frayed ends of the broken wires, their wait to hear the king would have been in vain. Sometimes our job is simply to grab hold of the wires, right, of God and of the people around us and, and be that connection so that His message and love and grace can reach them. And, and, and sometimes uh, it's not enough just to, to speak the Word of God or to show His love, but we have to grab on and, and we have to carry the cross uh, that Christ called us to carry. Paul says in Romans, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This is the job of every baptized believer. 
Uh, it's to go out and to speak for God and to show the love of God in our actions and to carry the cross of Christ and point the world to the goodness of our Savior. Let's be a prophetic witness today. Amen.